All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, in this edition to the Access Academy webinars. Today we'll be discussing about um, the difference between firstly Oxbridge and other UK universities as well as Oxford and Cambridge themselves. So before we begin, um, just a little introduction to Project Access and Access Academy. So Project Access is a non for profit organization that aims to widen access to top institutes for education to people from disadvantaged backgrounds. And Access Academy uh, aims to take the step before that um, and give you some insight into these top institutions and whether you uh, might like to join our mentorship program. So before we begin, just um, to let everyone know that if you have any questions, I'd like to direct your attention to the Q&A function you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions at all, no matter, there's no question too insignificant, um, just go ahead and leave them um, in that Q&A function. Uh, you can start leaving questions uh, from now. So uh, Jenny, do you wanna go to the next slide? So the contents of today's webinar First, we'll discuss about some of the goals we hope to achieve with this webinar. We'll introduce ourselves. And then, as I said, we'll discuss um, the differences between Oxbridge and other universities and whether even applying to Oxbridge um, is a decision you might want to make. And then we will go about uh, as to how you might choose between Oxford and Cambridge. And then we'll give some personal anecdotes as to why we chose to go to these universities and what our experiences has been like, and then we'll move on to the, we'll end with the Q&A session. So the goal of today's webinar broadly is just to demystify any misconceptions you might have about Oxbridge as universities and give you, I uh, hope to just clarify some confusion you might have and answer any questions. So um, yeah, we can move on to the next slide. So first, uh, some introductions. I'll go first. Uh, I'm Sean. I'm from Malaysia. I live in Kuala Lumpur. I'm kind of currently studying law at Oxford, but of course Oxford is pretentious and has to call it something else. They have to call it jurisprudence, which essentially is just philosophy of law. So I just finished my first year at Oxford and I'm working as a recruitment officer for the Oxford campus team. I'll hand off to Pooja. Yeah. Hi, I'm Pooja and I'm from India, Mumbai, India. I I am currently pursuing my BA and Master's in Engineering at Cambridge and I'm in my first year. I just finished my first year actually. And at my role at PA is Cambridge Campus Officer. Hi, I'm Jenny. I'm from Germany. I live in Munich where I'm also right now currently. And I'm studying PPE at Oxford also in my first year. And I work as at PA as the Oxford Training Officer. And also, just to add on, um, if you have any questions specifically about colleges, uh, I go to Worcester College at Oxford, Pooja goes to King's at Cambridge, and Jenny goes to Pembroke at Oxford. So if you happen to be interested in any of these colleges and have any questions about them, feel free to ask us as well. So, yeah. Can move on. Um, yeah, so I will be presenting the portion about whether Oxbridge might be universities that you might want to consider applying to. So how is Oxbridge different to other universities? Firstly, let's discuss the academic um, portions of uh, universities. I think one of the very big distinctive features about Oxbridge is that they are very academic, um, academically based. So even in, you're gonna be doing a lot more work and that's something that you definitely have to anticipate. Firstly, um, the university system. So Oxbridge um, functions uh, around a collegiate system, whereas most other universities except Durham don't have um, this collegiate system. So a collegiate system basically means that we have many different colleges um, and the university as a whole has um, decentralized administration of teaching and learning to these colleges. So 
when you're applying to Oxbridge, you don't apply to the university as a whole, you apply to a specific college. And that college is responsible for your academics, your teaching, your social, um, it is where your social life is gonna be mostly centered around and they're gonna be um, in charge of your mental well-being as well. And that is a reason why Oxbridge um, may be more advantages over other universities because um, you're going to have um, quite a structured life in these colleges Whereas some people experience in, for example, London universities that they can be quite alienated because it, they might find it hard to approach um, tutors in the university and their social lives don't really revolve around the university. Whereas for us, we have a lot of social events in our colleges. So it's very easy for us to make friends and to always meet people. Tutorial sizes. So the main way you'll be thought at um, Oxbridge is through tutorials. So this is, um, you can see at, at the bottom picture, it's gonna be two to three students with a tutor. Um, and you're gonna go into a very, uh, you're gonna go in depth into that week's material and discuss um, any essay you might have written or any um, problem sheets you may have completed. Um, in Oxford, we call it a tutorial. In Cambridge, we call it, in Cambridge, they call it a supervision. Uh, it's just a superficial differences. Um, but at other universities, they also have the tutorial system, but your class sizes are gonna be a lot bigger. You're gonna find that um, there are gonna be at least um, around eight people per tutorial. So what this means is that you're gonna have less um, personal contact with your tutor because they have so many other students and in a tutorial, they're not gonna get as much personalized attention. There are good and bad things to this, of course, if you haven't done your reading, you haven't, if you've written a bad essay that week, you're not gonna to wanna to be in a room with just one other person and your tutor because you're gonna be called out and you're not gonna know how to answer. But in the long run and thinking from the mind as an academic, <laughs> um, it's gonna be good because if you have really challenging questions, you're gonna be able to um, speak to your tutor at a much more personalized um, level, which is like why, again, why I said that Oxbridge is very focused around academics. Your workload is definitely gonna be much higher in Oxbridge. On average, it's said that Oxbridge students work about 40 hours a week. Um, Whereas uh, in Cambridge, they work an average of 48 hours a week. Um, and maybe some a reason why you might want to choose Oxford. But uh, at other universities, uh, it's definitely going to be <laughs> lower than that. Um, for example, uh, law, I had to write um, about 12 essays a term. So we have three terms in a year. Uh, my friend at Cambridge had to write about eight essays a term. Whereas my friend at UCL studying law as well had to write eight essays over the whole year. So the workload, uh, the, work the workload discrepancy is um, quite large. Of course, it will vary uh, between the amount of work you yourself want to put in and university is very much um, a self-motivated endeavor. But at the bare minimum, the work that you're expected to complete uh, the expectation is going to be much higher in Oxbridge. Um, because of that, the nature of study at Oxbridge is there's going to be a lot more emphasis on self-study. The reason for this is that you are going to have to teach yourself the material before you write your essay and before you go to your tutorial. So every week you have an essay or two or some problem sheets to complete. You don't get taught this material before, unless you go for lectures, but sometimes the lectures don't cover everything um, that you're expected to know. So you're gonna have to do a lot of independent reading to teach yourself the material before you even go to the tutorial. And the tutorial is where you actually iron out any confusion you may, might have had and any um, confusion you may have run into. Whereas in other universities, you will find that they will have more frequent classes and tutorials and lectures to teach you 
the material. Of course, this is again a broad generalization. It's gonna differ from university, but that is what you should be expecting when you are applying to Oxbridge. And finally, to make matters worse, our term lengths at Oxbridge are less than other universities. So we have eight week terms, whereas other universities usually have about 10 weeks or more. So this means on top of the workload, you're going to be, you're going to have less time to complete the work. So this is not meant to scare you or anything, but it's just meant to give you a realistic picture um, of what you should be expecting. I definitely wish I had known this um, before applying, just so I could have been more prepared when I came. Um, yeah, but we can move on to the next slide to maybe more fun stuff. <laughs> um, so social life. A big thing that I noticed, um, especially being an international student myself, and I would be expecting um, a lot of you to be international students as well, that the international student body at Oxbridge um, is not going to be as large as other universities. And I think the, one of the reasons for this is because the intake at Oxbridge is going to be smaller. Um, but if that is something that's important to you, uh, you might want to consider looking at other universities. Um, secondly, uh, you're going to have quite a unique university experience at Oxbridge because of how traditional it is. One aspect of this, as I've already spoken about, is the college collegiate system, how you, you live in your colleges. Other traditions, um, you're when everyone at Oxbridge um, begins university, you have a process called matriculation. It's your formal induction into the university. You have um, academic dress um, called gowns. So at Oxford, we call them subfusk. Uh, at, uh, in Cambridge, is there a specific name? Pooja? Um, the thing is, Kings, actually, we, we're not required to wear gowns at all. Oh, OK. Um, for any event, so I'm not really sure about the whole gown. Um, oh, OK. So I, yeah, so what that shows is that this is also a generalization. It's going to differ from college to college. But um, one of the traditions is the gown, and which you can see at the bottom right. We, at Oxford, we have two types of gowns, the commonish gown and the scholar's gown. Uh, so whenever you have exams, that's what you're going to be wearing uh, when you have when you go for formal dinner, which is another tradition we have, um, that's another thing you're gonna be wearing. So formal dinner is, is a formal dinner, but for some reasons, especially um, important at Oxbridge. Uh, and you're not gonna find most of these traditions at other universities, um, except they, have, they do wear gowns and formals at Durham. So the university experience you're gonna have at Oxbridge is gonna be quite different. Yeah, so we can move on. Uh, and applications. So these are just quite general um, things you should be um, note, you should take note of. The UK state line for Oxbridge is much earlier. It takes place in 15th at 15th October, whereas for other universities, the deadline is 15th of January. So you're going to have a few more months to complete your UCAS if you need that time. And at Oxbridge, you're going to have to do an interview. I believe um, Pooja and Jenny will, uh, Jenny will talk more about this later on. But this is, for some people, can make the application process a lot more strenuous and um, stressful. And you're not going to find um, interviews at any other universities. All right. So I'll hand over to Pooja and uh, Jenny now. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's my part first, right, Jenny, could you go to the next slide? Yeah, uh, okay, so right now I'm going to talk about how you should, you know, sort of decide whether to choose Oxford or Cambridge if you have decided to apply to Oxbridge. So I think the most important factor that you really should consider is the course structure of your subject. So once you've decided what you want to study, you should really go to the websites of both Cambridge and Oxford and um, sort of look through what courses they are, if they offer your course in the first place. And if 
after they have. So the thing is, Oxford and Cambridge don't actually offer identical courses. While some courses do have a lot in common, there are certain that are only available at one of the universities. So um, some examples are, you can only study PPE at Oxford, which is politics, philosophy, and economics. Um, while Cambridge um, is the only one that offers education as a degree at the undergraduate level. Um, Another course where it's different is for the natural science course, uh, natural science course. So Cambridge allows you to sort of do a broad science degree and then later on specialize in like your second and third year, whereas Oxford requires you to choose the science course that you want to study uh, when you apply. So these are, the, these are just important differences to note when choosing whether to apply to Oxford or Cambridge. Um, yeah, uh, and another thing that you should probably be aware of is the exam structure. So at Oxford, you basically, your results in your finals determine your class of degree. So um, if I'm not wrong, you only have um, two exams throughout your three years, right? In your first and your third year, right? Um, whereas in Cambridge, we have this exam system called the TriPass, which means we basically have a formal assessment at the end of each year. And um, we are awarded a degree classification for each exam. Um, so about the social life between uh, the differences, there's not um, gonna be much difference uh, as the slide shows, uh, but just some things to be aware of. Uh, the size of the Two town, two places are quite different. So Oxford is considered a city, whereas um, Cambridge is considered a town. And uh, being the humorous person I am, I used uh, a picture of a narrow alleyway in uh, Cambridge to, and a wide street <laughs> in Oxford to symbolize this. Um, but in all seriousness, you're gonna find much wider roads uh, in Oxford, much longer high street. Uh, the shops in Oxford close uh, later than in Cambridge. So if you need to stay, if you need to go out shopping at 7 p.m., um, that's going to be possible in Oxford. Unfortunately, not in Cambridge. Uh, in terms of societies, I think um, your experience is going to be pretty much the same. Both uh, universities offer um, a wide range of societies and events and talks to attend, so that shouldn't be a factor to consider, uh, unless there's a very specific society that you might want to join. Um, Pooja, do you want to share anything about uh, societies um, at Cambridge? Yeah, sure. So one um, really sort of important part of social life for uh, some people are the varsity sports. So I am a part of the varsity squash team, which is basically um, the team, so both Oxford and Cambridge have varsity sports teams and they play against each other once a year um, and either Oxford or Cambridge wins. Um, so yeah, again, I played squash, you have a lot of sports, you have rowing, which is probably one of the most famous ones. Um, so if you are interested in sports, this is something that you should look at, figure out probably which, college, uh, which university is stronger. I'd say Cambridge, <laughs> but... <laughs> Another thing to note um, is that Cambridge has three all-female colleges, whereas you're not going to find this at Oxford. So for any females watching, if um, you might want to go to all-girls college, uh, that, that's unique to Cambridge. Okay, we can move on. Yeah, so I'm just going to talk uh, a bit about the application process, which might which doesn't differ a lot between Oxford and Cambridge because um, as you can see from the uh, graph, we have um, once you completed your UCAS application and send it off by October, you have some um, pre-interview assessments. Um, then you might, you might be required to send in some written work, but this really depends on uh, the course you're choosing. So for like, um, arts and social sciences degrees, some of them do require you to send in some essays you've written at school. 
Then you have the at interview assessment. And this is something I think which uh, I will also talk about later, but this is probably more common at Cambridge. And then you have the interview at both universities. Um, and this is like both of them are in December, the at interview assessment and the interview, obviously. And the basically the written part is before and will be finished around November. Then in Cambridge, you will have a very college dependent application process. This means like grade requirements, the written work and whether you have at interview assessments will vary from college to college, which is not the case in Oxford because you have really centralized requirements. Um, that means you will just go on the Oxford admissions website and will state clearly uh, what the entry requirements are and what the parts of the application process is. And then at Cambridge, you will see that um, one college might require you to send in some written work, the other doesn't, and it might not just be dependent on course, um, such as at Oxford. Then for the grade requirements at Cambridge, usually uh, they have higher requirements. So for example, A star, A star, A for most sciences and only and A star, A, A for arts courses. And you will also see the equivalent for the IB. And this is probably also going to be, you know, converted to the other um, international qualifications. Whereas in, at Oxford, um, offers range between AAA and A star, A star, A. Of course, they might have um, the same requirements as Cambridge for some courses, but for a lot of courses, um, Oxford does have, um, I think, slightly more lenient uh, requirements. But again, this very much depends on um, on the course you're applying to. Then um, Cambridge interviews around 75% of all applicants, whereas at Oxford, it's usually around 50%, so much less. And this is also because Oxford often has a more pre-interview assessments. That means uh, based on your score, you will then be interviewed or not. Whereas at Cambridge, they might not have pre-interview assessments, but interview more people. And then at the interview, they might have other assessments again. Um, but this again also depends on the course you're um, choosing. And as I said before, at Cambridge, you, it might, um, you might have at interview assessments and they might be either you know, mutually exclusive or you might have both kind of assessments. And this again also depends on the college um, at Cambridge. And at Oxford, it's usually pre-interview assessments. And yeah, I haven't yet heard of at interview assessments, but it might be kind of part of the interview. So just as a quick summary, um, we have talked about how Oxford has slightly lower grade requirements um, and that Cambridge conducts more interviews. And that's also why at interview assessments are more common then Cambridge requirements are college specific. Um, and this is something I haven't talked about before, but Cambridge's colleges um, may modify offers. And this is explicitly stated on their admissions website of Cambridge. And it means that depending on your individual circumstances, so maybe you come from a disadvantaged background um, or you might have encountered some difficulties, um, this might mean that you might get um, a more lenient offer or you might even get a more challenging offer than is you know stated on the Cambridge website which says for example typically people um, people's offers are A star A star A but you might get A star AA um, so this basically means that even if you think you don't have the required grades um, so you might have, for example, just AAA, you might still want to um, apply because you might have, again, as I said, accounted any difficulties or have some difficult background, and then Cambridge will account for this and might uh, modify your offer. But this is also, I think, the case for Oxford as well. Um, although, as I said before, Oxford already does offer some, you know, lower requirements, but they also will take account of your background. 
but it might just be useful to know that they do have some constraints, but they might be uh, um, modified by background rate. So it means that once you decided on your course, you need to look at both UNIS requirements. And then if you think Cambridge might be something you're interested in, you should look at the individual Cambridge College admissions website again for more details, because as I said, they might have lower requirements and they might have different steps in the application process. And it also means that you really shouldn't hesitate when uh, contacting the relevant Cambridge College admissions office, because they are really happy to help. And this is the case for Oxford as well. But as I said, Oxford's requirements are pretty clear. Um, whereas in Cambridge, you can just contact them and ask specifically, depending on what grades you have, and they will, they really should answer um, quite quickly as well. So, yep, just as a tip, don't hesitate to do that. Um, so the next bit would just be our personal experience, um, why we chose Oxbridge. And I will first talk about Oxford, so we called it Spotlight. Um, and I'm studying PPE, if you might remember, and it was basically this reason why I chose Oxford, because Cambridge just doesn't offer PPE. I know Cambridge does offer some other similar course called, I think, Human Sciences and Political Sciences, but this wasn't something I'm interested in because I really wanted the philosophy part and I wanted the economics part and I wanted the politics part, whereas um, the Human Sciences and Political Sciences also has some sociology and I think, yeah, some, it's, it's just a bit different and it's, pretty much the main reason I chose Oxford. But you might, as we also said before, um, consider that Oxford is just, um, it, might be, it might be a bit more lively in the sense that there are many um, just normal Oxford residents there that aren't students, as you can see from the um, picture on the right at the top. So it's, you, it won't be just, you know, students on the streets, but really just the normal people in the city. And for example, a friend of mine uh, and I went to some improv show in December, I think it was, and it was just really great comedy. And, but we, we were, I think, the only Oxford students there. So the rest were just interested um, Oxford people that went there as well. Um, so you can see that the streets are often uh, at least this very, this high street is like full with people. I don't think I've ever been on the high street when it was not crowded. I don't <laughs> think it's always crowded. Yeah, you need to go there like during Corona because that's the only, yeah, time where it's probably very kind of scary. There have been also videos, I think, online where, um, I don't know, they use some I don't think they use drones, but like they just had uh, recordings of Oxford and Cambridge while um, while there were heavy restrictions, and that it just was a very different city and very different town. I think, um, yeah. So I think this is something that is not the case for Cambridge that we have such uh, emphasis on the gowns. As Sean said before, as you can see from my, my picture as well from matriculation, where we all had to wear the whole, not just gown, but like also the shirt and this ribbon thing um, for girls at least. And it's just much more common, I think, that you wear gowns at Oxford. And this might be something you, you might like as well, especially if you're into Harry Potter or something. And then something else that some people, you know, it's pretty much, um, it, people say that Cambridge is prettier, but I just wanted to show that Oxford has some, has rivers as well, firstly, <laughs> and even two, and that you have some beautiful meadows as well. So the right, uh, right picture shows Christchurch meadows, and you can like go there for walks and even punting um, on the river during summer. Yep, I think that's it for um, the Oxford Spotlight. Um, so I'm just going to talk about really why I chose Cambridge. Um, and um, 
why I probably think you should do. Uh, <laughs> so uh, to begin with, uh, to be honest, I didn't have a really solid reason as to why I chose Cambridge. It was sort of, I, I decided to apply to Cambridge just like a, a month before the deadline and it was all a really rushed process. And um, I had done Cambridge International A-level, so I figured that it would probably be easier for me to adjust with um, academics and curriculum at Cambridge. Um, and uh, in terms of just applying, it was actually a really rigorous procedure, uh, along with the pre-interview assessment that I had. I had one interview, I had one at interview assessment, and then I had a seminar on a topic that we hadn't been taught, and then I had an assessment on that. Um, so again, it depends on the college. Uh, so some colleges will do like two interviews, one academic, one where you have to present um, like an engineering project or something like that. So yeah, as, as uh, Jenny pointed out, um, Cambridge is the sort of application process past your pre-interview and uh, assessment and your interview can sort of really vary depending on which college and which course you apply to. Um, other than that, living in Cambridge, honestly, has been amazing. I Surprisingly, I love the weather. I love the cold and the rain. And it's just, <laughs> people think it's weird, but I do love it. Um, and as you can see, it's quite, I, I'd say, prettier than Oxford. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I study at King's College, which is what I have put down at the bottom um, right. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically, again, yeah, Cambridge is definitely a much smaller sort of town. But um, at the same point, uh, I, you know, you sort of get this really community feel and it's always full of students and it's uh, yeah, quite unlike Oxford, it's just full of students and anyone you bump into is either a student or a tourist. Um, but yeah, I have so far thoroughly enjoyed my experience at Cambridge. However, it has been really um, academically rigorous and I've had a lot of work that are times that I was like, oh God, there's no way I'm going to be able to finish this amount of work in such a short period of time. But we sort of get used to it. And I think in the future, it will really help you learn to work under pressure. Um, yeah, so if you do decide to apply to either Oxford or Cambridge, you just need to really be interested in what you want to study. And no matter which university you choose, you're going to have the same opportunities later on. So just really ensure you love what you're studying. Yeah, that's pretty much all I had to say. All right, we'll move on to the Q&A. So if you have any questions, please feel free to leave it in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so Pooja, if you want to go ahead and pick up yeah. any questions. So uh, we have one question uh, from Homera. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm hardworking, but I'm just cu curious a little that if I didn't pass in the exam, then what will I do? Because I am going to apply for the university on scholarship. Um, I'm assuming she means that if she doesn't pass her A-levels or her school exams, or is she talking about the interview? If she doesn't meet her offer. Yeah, if she doesn't meet her offer. Um... Does anyone want to take that? I think the best thing to do would be to, the first thing you should definitely do is to contact your college directly and to see if they can handle exam in university. Oh, oh, so if she doesn't pass the exam when she's at university. Oh, I see. So do you want to take that Pooja since you, since that's more, I think, Okay, um, yeah, I, I think, okay, so A, if you do have any extenuating circumstances in the sense that you were ill or you had um, personal issues or mental health issues or, you know, any really sort of grave issues, I, I'm i again not entirely sure, but I do think they will give you some sort of leave it. However, if you fail and you don't really have a certain reason, you will... Uh, 
uh, at least in Cambridge, you're usually not allowed to continue and you will be sent off. Yeah, I mean, I think at um, Oxford it's similar. So it means basically uh, that you can, I think it's called, um, you can suspend either on health reasons, but also if you're basically struggling academically. And it means that it just puts you on stop. So you don't pay any uh, fees, any course fees, any living fees, but basically you return home for some period of time that you specify together with your college or with the um, university. And then you can basically work um, alone on yourself and on the, for example, preparing for exams. So it will give you, it means basically that you can come back and then take retake the exam and successfully pass or even like before this if you feel you're struggling really hard and then it just gives you th this breathing space and also uh, this might be also worth mentioning i think the um i don't think that many people fail right so i know for example in first year exams at oxford um really in a like in the huge cohort i think maybe one or two people fail and mostly like and usually like for really good reasons, for example, health reasons. So it shouldn't be something you need to be worried about, I think. So firstly, because it is very unlikely that you will fail. And secondly, that you can, you know, have time to take off and retake the exam. Um, but if this is also about the scholarship and if you're going to miss the offer for the continued scholarship, um, I think that would depend if the scholarship is given by the university or if it's an external scholarship. So if, if it's an external scholarship, I mean, of course, it'll depend on the conditions of that scholarship, um, whether they'll allow you to retake if you do fail or you fail to meet the requirement. Um, if it's an internal scholarship, um, do any of you have any experience with that? No, I, I I think the best sort of approach is if, God forbid, you ever are in a position like that, it would be best to just contact, um, you know, either your Ox your Oxford uh, tutor or your um, Cambridge sort of your uh, director of studies and just let them know about your situation. Send emails to whoever is sponsoring your scholarship. Just contact people and I'm sure they will help you with it. But it's not something I think we can really provide. I, yeah, I think it's very, it's going to be very dependent on the type of scholarship that you have. Um, but okay. usually I think scholarships do accept at least a 2-1 and um, you're going to have to work for a 2-1, but I don't think it's something that you should be too worried about. Uh, yeah, so let's move on to the next question. Okay, um, right. So is there any age limit? Uh, so I just Googled this and there is no age limit except for medicine courses. Um, I know someone who went to Oxford uh, when he was 14 to study physics. So I wouldn't recommend going that <laughs> young because he didn't have a great experience. But um, I don't think that there is a limit except for Cambridge. But the social aspect is something you're going to need to consider. Um, yeah, and I also think, again, if you're, uh, say, like older and 25 and stuff, in Cambridge especially, we have these colleges called mature colleges, where um, a lot of students who are 22 and above um, sort of go. So again, you can always check that out. Um, okay, hi, I'm, I'm from Peru and I want to know about the scholarship. Uh, is there a specific scholarship um, you To be want to honest, I don't think Oxford and Cambridge provide many scholarships. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Again, I think scholarship is something that Axe Academy will be doing a webinar about and a reason you should sort of join Project Access as a mentee because you will have a mentor who will know a lot more about your personal situation and will be able to answer a lot of these more detailed questions. So please do sort of check out Project Access and join as a mentee. 
because this is information that we currently don't have at the moment but if you're paired with a mentor you definitely will get you will have i think in general a scholarship is something you apply for after you've received your offer at oxbridge um yeah okay um tell us about the ielts score for both oxford and cambridge the english exam i think what what is do you guys know what the grade requirements are um, no i did any of you have to have to take the ielts yeah i took the ielts and i think they said that they wanted a 7 7.5 maybe on um like as the whole test and they wanted to have 7.0 in each of the components so i i actually failed the <laughs> failed the ielts test on first try because i mean i had i think 8 on average but i had um, in one component, I think it was the writing part, I had 6.5 and this was too low because I had to get 7.0, so I had to retake it. Um, yeah, but I think because they want to have, I mean, Oxford and Cambridge do have quite high IELTS scores. So, for example, if you apply to London unis, I think it's like 0 0.5 points below. Yeah, um, I think yeah, Cambridge, the minimum requirement is a 7.0. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, could you share some, so from Iga, Iga, okay. Hi, could you share some tips about the preparation for ENGA and preparation for engineering at Cambridge in general, especially if my course structured school is a bit different and I haven't had, and I haven't had electric circuits yet. Do they take what you've already learned into account? Okay. Um, yeah, so I can I can give you a bit of information about this right now, but again, I would suggest you join Project Access and get a mentor who can help you a lot with this. So in terms of preparation for ENGA, you should really just um, online, I think they, Cam the University of Cambridge itself provides past papers. So you should just do that. And if you probably just search for um, ENGA resources, which is, uh, so ENGA is basically an, pre-interview um, admissions test for engineering specifically. Uh, so if you just search online for ENGA prep, you might find a few textbooks. So you should just really work through um, a few problems. And uh, I'd say mainly just look at the past papers already on the Cambridge website. Um, and yeah, uh, so they do take into account what you already have learned. So you can always mention that in, um, I think that the, I had something called the COPA, which was specific for Cambridge. And I was able to mention if I had any um, sort of extenuating circumstances. And again, you can always email um, the admissions uh, Re the admission reps at Cambridge and ask them any specific questions that you have. What do you guys think about um, sort of coming from a different background and not having the entire knowledge required? Do you know anything about that? I think for us, our interviews are not very, um, what's the word? Uh, Content-based, we don't really need to have knowledge about um, like our pre-interview like assessments and the interview itself, we didn't need to have knowledge about the content. So it's hard to say. Yeah, okay. So I, I just think sort of in summary, do the past papers online that are on the website for Anger. And again, when you're called for interview, you can sort of mention that you haven't done circuits because you come from a different background to your interviewers. And I'm sure they'll take that into account. Okay, this is for you, Sean. Hey, Sean, do you know of any differences in the course structure between Oxford and Cambridge law courses? And why did you choose Oxford over Cambridge? Is there perhaps a greater emphasis on jurisprudence slash the philosophical aspects of law at Oxford as compared to Cambridge? No, there is no greater emphasis, I think. Um, in terms of the modules that you're going to study, you're not going to do 
any jurisprudence apart from the jurisprudence model, uh, module itself. But the difference with Ox uh, Cambridge is that jurisprudence as a module is compulsory, whereas in Cambridge it's not. Uh, that is the extent of the emphasis, I suppose. Uh, then differences with the course structure. I think the biggest one for me was the exam structure. So for law, we have um, exams at the end of second term first year. And then your next exam is going to be at the end of your third year. So what that means is that in your finals, you're going to have nine papers to complete. It may sound little, but it's really quite a lot, I think. Whereas in Cambridge, you have exams at the end of every th three years and the content that you learned that year ends with the exam you did that year. So every year you're going to have about four or five papers to complete. So much more um, spread out. Uh, that's one reason that I would um, strongly recommend looking at Cambridge if you think that um, you're going to struggle with completing the line papers. And it's actually something that I didn't know before applying. So, um, Another thing is that Cambridge, um, the course is a lot more flexible. You have a lot more options. So starting from your second year, you have like most of your course is going to be options. Whereas at Oxford, we only have two options. Um, so for example, if you don't want to study jurisprudence at Cambridge, you're not going to have to do that because it's an option. Um, I don't think anything else stands out to me. And you why have did to, you choose, sorry, why did you oh. choose Oxford over Cambridge? Um, I, I chose Oxford for two reasons. One is the grade requirements for law were a lot lower than Cambridge. Um, and I didn't want to take the risk of missing an offer. And secondly was um, because my the college I applied to had a lake, uh, quite superficial, but <laughs> yeah, it was a pretty lake. It's a very convincing lake. So to be honest, I didn't really do that much um, research into the academics portion, which is something that I do regret. But no matter where you end up, I think you're gonna, your experience is largely going to be the same, but kind of the content itself is gonna be the same, so yeah. If you have any questions, you can email me, any more questions about law, you can email me. Yeah. Um. I want to know about the scholarships the University of Cambridge provides. Again, we aren't really the best people to answer that. So I would suggest one, again, join Project Access and to look out for the webinars because I do think that we will have some webinars on um, scholarships coming up on the Access Academy soon. Yeah, and maybe also just um, check out the uh, Cambridge website because I think they should have all the scholarships stated there because there aren't that many. So it's quite, um, I think, at least for Oxford, you can even like choose from, um, you know, which country you're from and which scholarships you might be eligible for. So do you can do that. Yeah, and also I think um, some colleges give scholarships. But again, that's only after you've got into the university, they'll send you a form. And it's usually only if it's, it's like need based. So only if you can't um, pay, if, if you sort of have to fill in um, the financial, I think, status of your family. And only if you like cannot pay the fees, will they give you some sort of scholarship? They usually don't provide merit based scholarship. Mm -hmm. Um, what are the educational requirements for the for Oxbridge? I, she okay. I have not passed any exam like A level, A level or IB exam. After just passing the second education in Pakistan, will I be able to apply for the for Oxbridge? Um, let me I'm googling it now. Let me see if I can just find any information. Um, so when you say 
second education do you mean have you finished like your 12th grade have you finished um the whole of your schooling um or like in what level have you got up to in school kamara if you could just answer that we could probably provide you with more information and generally i think um they have pretty like equivalent standards so as you saw before if they have a star a star a for a level this will also be converted into all the others but it might be that if there aren't like super well known standardized um exams for example in pakistan i'm not too sure about the situation there but it might be that they have some i know at least for lse had this they had some other tests you can do Mm-hmm. Yeah um so like even in India some people write the indian boards but they can still obviously apply to oxford and cambridge and they will just convert the scores that you have got onto an a level basis and again i'm sure they've obviously had a lot of applicants from pakistan before so they definitely will have some sort of system to convert so that shouldn't be something that you're worried about Uh, I'm reading from the Cambridge website that the intermediate or higher secondary certificate is not considered um suitable preparation. So if that is the level which you have completed up till unfortunately you will not be able to apply at least to Cambridge. So you will need to take additional qualifications like the A level or IB or any equivalent. Um So, sorry wait, higher secondary as in like if she's completed 12 years of school i'm assuming that she's sort of i have no idea the, the website just says um, secondary certificate let me see um hamara what board exactly are you studying maybe if you can mention that we could just check that out too um but in the meanwhile we can answer her other question which is do you guys recommend um cambridge or oxford for the llb program which i'm assuming is law yeah so um i mean at cambridge or oxford we call it ba but um i would recommend if you would if you are an academically driven person and you are not afraid to work hard and you are self motivated and can deal with treasure and a lot of stress i think oh, law lasting between cambridge and oxford oh okay um um i think they're going to be about the same but as i said um cambridge you're going to have a bit more flexibility with your course and the exam structure is different so it's more spread out um so if you like having your exam spread out i would suggest cambridge um but oxford's good as well <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was yeah, just think, looking at colleges as well to take into account um, of that. Yeah, I think regardless of what course you want to study and whether Cambridge or Oxford, in the end, you're going to get the same level of education. It's really about what suits you and what fits you. So it's a lot of personal research that you probably need to do. But again, you're going to get the same um, academic experience at either university. So you can't really go wrong. Okay. Um, okay, we have another question. Uh, may I ask how you guys decided on your respective colleges? Well, for me, it was the lake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, plain and simple. <laughs> Jenny, what about you? Um, so basically, I was very late with my application, and even later with the a college choice. um what i did in the end was basically it was just pretty i was just trying to make my life easier for myself 
Um, so I had some sort of mentor. He wasn't. He was actually a mentor from Project Access, but I didn't um, uh, know him through Project Access. But anyway, I just chose the same college he was in because I was like, he had a great experience, so I can't go wrong with choosing his college. And um, I as well chose a co uh, considered choosing a college just because. It was a very pretty college and it had a really pretty river on the uh, Google pictures. But then my mentor actually said, no, don't apply to this because it's very far away from this city center, but like relatively. So it meant that, for example, to get to your lectures, you will need to walk between 20 or 30 minutes, which isn't like that far. Um, but it just is something to consider, like whether your college is central or not. And my mentor was like, apply to a college that's in that's near the center because it just makes life a bit more, like a bit easier and more convenient if you go to lectures, if you go um, to any events, or even if you have tutorials at other colleges or at other classes, which might be the case. Um, so it's just a bit easier, but yeah, this was just my personal. Um, yeah, um, academically, it won't really matter which college you choose because you're going to get your degree and your teaching from the university itself. Uh, however, I do agree with Jenny. I think choosing a college that's near your department or sort of central to the town is really helpful. That's that's the, really the only reason I chose King's. I knew nothing about King's other than the fact that it was close to the engineering department because again, it's just, like Jenny, I was really late um, in finally deciding to apply. Um, but yeah, I'm really happy that I chose King's because it's also sort of right in the center. So whether it's um, restaurants or um, grocery shopping or even clubs, they're all literally five minutes away from King's. Uh, so I really do think you should look at location because I do think that will help sort of in the long run. Okay. Um, okay, so Humaira has, so she's, oh, Humaira's actually in the, finished the first year of university in Pakistan. Do they allow you to switch mid-university? Yeah, you, I have, um, I know two people who are going to Oxford who, reapplied after finishing a year at university. So that's not going to be a barrier. The thing is whether they will use your first year university grades or your 12th grade um, exams. And that is not something that I've been able to find out. So I would suggest emailing the emailing um, the university for clarification, because I think this is quite um, quite a specific case. So I don't think we are the best people to answer this. Mm -hmm. Yes, really like feel free to ask them because they won't be like, I don't know, noting down your name and things like this. Yeah, uh, if you ever have any specific questions, always feel free to just email the university because they will be very helpful. And get back to you soon. Sorry about that, Kamara. Okay. Uh, any opinion about Downing College? Do I have to have a crazy amount of super curriculars? Do you guys have a Downing College in Oxford? No, no, no. It's okay, Cambridge. so then it's the one in Cambridge, yeah. Um, I, I don't personally have any opinion about Downing College. I don't really think I've been to Downing. Um, but in regards to extracurriculars, you, you don't really need to have a lot. I mean, I don't think Oxford really even cares about your extracurricular. No. They only really care about what you've done outside school that, that relates to the subject that you want to do. So for example, if you're doing um, English and one of your extracurriculars is writing a book, then obviously they would be interested. But really to just be focused on what subject and course that you're gonna pursue, don't, you don't have to do a crazy amount of extracurriculars that aren't related to your course. Yeah, extracurriculars is not, not gonna be very important for your application process to Oxbridge. As we said, it's very academically driven. So as Pooja said, you're going to want to focus on anything related to your academics. 
Um, as for Downing College, I hear that the rooms are very nice. They're like hotel rooms. They have double beds. Um, this is something very different. Um, you're not going to see that any other college. And um, okay, like any other college, is very pretty. Oh, really? You, do you have a double bed? Yeah, uh, this uh, this year we do have the option for double bed. In fact, last year my room was uh, double floor. Like I had a sort of stairs in my wow. room. <laughs> Guys are playing games. <laughs> <laughs> but I have heard Downing, the rooms look like hotel rooms. They're quite modern rooms. They're not old. Some people don't like that. My, one of my friends at Cambridge doesn't like being in a modern room. She wanted to be in an mm -hmm. old crumbling room. Excuse <laughs> me why, but uh, yeah. Jenny, do you have any <laughs> ideas about Downing? <laughs> Oh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> do you guys have anything to say about extracurriculars? Anything else to add? Or... Okay. I think extracurriculars in your personal statement at least would, uh, should only take about 5% of your personal statement. And at interview, they're not good. I, I highly doubt they're going to ask you about extracurriculars unless they ask you about your personal statement. And even then, it's going to be focused on the academic as aspects. Of your personal oh, statement. Um, sorry, but at the same time, I actually did a lot of art as an extracurricular and design. So I sort of also built uh, models mm -hmm. of um, structures and stuff, which I then actually showed my interviewers at interview. And um, since I'm, I applied for engineering, I was also able to show how I'm design oriented and I can sort of, you know, build structures and model them. So. Again, if you do have some extracurriculars that are really out there, it would obviously be good to put it on your personal statement or talk about it during your interview, but you shouldn't, you don't need to necessarily go out of your way to do something that is not related to your course. It, it has, it should be, anything you talk about should be related to your course. Yeah. Okay. Um, can I ask one more thing? Is it usually one-to-one -one teaching at both Oxford and Cambridge? I only have one module where I have one-to-one -one tutes, I think. So uh, usually it's about, usually it's two people per tutorial, at least for law at Oxford. I think he just means more in general, is it usually like the supervision style of teaching? I'm guessing that's what he meant. Uh, I mean, also like Benjamin, you can feel free to ask more questions you can. <laughs> Um, because you said, may I ask just one more question? But I think um, if you mean like the number, um, in, I think in the first year at least, where it's very introductory level, I think, this things. And if you apply to very popular courses where they have, you know, many students at one college doing this course, it will very likely be that you will have like two people in each tutorial or like three people even. Um, but I know, for example, at my college, there's only one student who's doing philosophy and psychology. It's actually called PPL, so with linguistics as well, but they actually only study two out of them. And he's the only student who's doing this combination. And he, that means he was the only one having a certain structure, a uh, course structure. And this meant that he had um, like tutorials with just him and the professor in um, I think in philosophy across the whole year. Uh, no, sorry, across only two terms out of the three. So it means, I mean, if you're really like into this one-to-one -one, uh, tutorial teaching, you might, you know, um, this would be more likely if you have very specialized um, degrees that don't, not that many people do. And I think maybe in second year and third year where you specialize further and you're the only one at your college doing this, um, combination you might get like one-to-one -one, I think yeah and in terms of just how often you have these uh, one to two or one-on-one uh, -on -one, um, sort of supervisions it depends again on your course so for example I had four papers in my first year and so I had four different I had not four I think I had five different um, supervisors so, and every two weeks, I would have a total of five supervisions. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. How did you experience the interviews at Oxbridge? Uh, Jenny, do you want to start? 
Yeah, sure. Um, I think I really enjoyed it. Um, so I had the in-person interviews and that meant I flew to Oxford for just, I think, three days. And um, if you're meaning just the interview specifically, I found them quite, I really liked them um, because I was before very nervous about not knowing things. So I was nervous that I didn't know enough about economics. Um, I was even afraid of not knowing enough of the current affairs in economics and that I couldn't like explain them very, you know, um, academically, but this was not the case because at least for PPE, they said, and I think it's, it's the case for most courses, they say they don't require you to have the knowledge already. So it meant that my interviews were really constructed in a way that I could answer them without any knowledge um, at all. So it was um, a bit like logic puzzles and um, a bit mathsy in economics as well. Um, and the tutors were very nice and um, it just felt quite, you know, interactive and it was quite chill, the atmosphere. So I really liked them because you could feel that they are not out there to kind of trap you, um, but it was just getting to know your thought process and also not about your um, current knowledge. Sean, what about you? Um, I would add that I think the interviewers just want to get to know you as a person because they're going to have to teach you for the next three years so they're not there to psych you out or to scare you or anything um, at least for my interviews I thought they were very friendly even where I to be honest I had no idea what my tutor what the interviewer was asking me um, I just kept making mistakes and he kept just kept correcting me until I got to the right um, point. Um, so advice for interviews, I would say is just be yourself. Don't try not to be too nervous. It's easier said than done. And don't be afraid to be wrong. Um, and don't be afraid to change your mind um, and just voice your opinions. I think people overthink the interviews a little bit um, but at the end of the day, it's just to simulate what a tutorial or supervision is going to be like. Um, so just try to enjoy it. Even if you fail, like, even if you feel like you failed, um, like I did, I think, uh, it's, you shouldn't think too much about it. What about you, Pooja? How was yours? Yeah, um, I, I also really actually enjoyed my interview. I was really scared before because I heard these interview horror stories and I was just like, oh God. <laughs> but what I realized is really as what Sean and Jenny said, that only there to guide you and see if, see how you learn and if they can teach you. It's not a question of your skill or of your grade require, of your grades because if you've been accepted to an interview, it means you already are capable. Um, academically, they just want to see how you fit into the environment and how you work with supervision systems and stuff like that. So they really just want to see if they can teach you and if you're sort of open to learning. Uh, so again, even if you make mistakes, in fact, they want you to make mistakes so that they can sort of guide you through it and see if you can take hints from them and really be open to, as Sean said, changing your mind and really learning from them uh, and they do not expect you to know everything they really expect you only to um, sort of be able to start and then have the ability to work with them so yeah please don't be afraid they're genuinely very nice people and I love I genuinely love the experience okay um uh, Okay, sorry, I meant those extra activities related to the course. I'm scared I don't have enough um, extracurricular activities is due to my disability. I couldn't attend few of the activities that were available to other students. Um, well, I think if it's, it was due to your disability, then that's no one can fault you for that. Uh, I think Supercurricular activities, again, 
they are only useful insofar as that they demonstrate your academic ability. So you, there are other ways to demonstrate your academic ability other than supercurricular activities. So um, I wouldn't worry if you lack supercurricular activities as long as you have other evidence of your academic um, ability, like your reading of books and articles, or just even like a very personal um, an original personal statement, well-written one, I think. So I don't think you should be worried about not having extracurricular activities that you couldn't do because of your disability. That's obviously it's not your, to your fault. Exactly. Yeah, go ahead, Jenny. Okay, okay. yeah, for, uh, for example, for my um, subject, I didn't really have any super uh, curricular activities. Um, I mean, I didn't like, I don't know, um, were a student journalist or I don't know, did any internship with politicians or whatever, but it really just wasn't necessary because, um, you know, once you've got the grades, once you got, you got the test um, and did well on it, you get invited to the interview. And then at the interview, it really just, um, you know, they just look at the whole picture and then they get to know you and then they get, get to know your thought process. And during this, like your super curricular activists which don't matter at all. Like it might impress them in some way before the interview, but I think you, as uh, Sean said, you just really don't need to worry because you can show, um, show them you can do it in just other ways, especially at interviews. Um, so it's just a nice thing to have, but it's just very, um, really not necessary. Yeah, and other ways you can sort of show interest in your course are by doing online courses, or as Sean said, just reading up a lot more. You don't need to have any special extracurricular activities as such. Honestly, yeah. I think they may be more impressed if you are able to discuss like articles about the subject in your personal so statement, true. because that, that's what you're going to be doing. That's what they want you to be doing at university. They don't want you really to be doing extracurriculars. What they want you to do is to be studying. Yeah, unlike the US, UK just doesn't give as much sort of yeah. weight to it. Yeah, it would be a yeah, different question for, a different answer for the US. Um, I so, think that's yeah. it with the questions. Do you guys mm -hmm. have something to say? Ooh, time's up to actually. Yeah, we've run over. So uh, Jenny, actually, if you can go to the next slide. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, our email addresses are on here. Um, if you just want to note that down, if you have any more questions that you might want to ask us personally, maybe it's to do with the, our subject, our college, feel free to email us. Um, sorry we've run over, but um, we hope that everyone found this session um, useful, insightful. We hope we've cleared up some confusion. Uh, but yeah, thanks for joining. Um, there are more uh, webinars coming up, so make sure you look at the website. And um, if you're interested, make sure to sign up to be to get a mentor with Project Access. So, uh, you guys want to sign off? Yeah, just thank you for joining. I enjoyed this um, webinar. Thank you for all your questions, and yeah, please do email us if you have any more. Okay, thanks guys.